Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you're joining for the first time, this is part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We always have one vendor that we typically review, and we are also going to re be reviewing some of the stories related to ERP or digital transformation from this week. Our approach is always going to be we first look for the financial statements if they are going to be available. Then we look for the marketing positioning. We go back and see how they have positioned in the market. And then the third dimension that we typically take is going to be trends in the user reviews. That's our methodology to review these vendors. So first, we are going to start with everybody's intro. And after that, we are going to dig right into the topic. Phil, uh, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Hi, Sam. Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Kerper, Managing Director of Ringling Business Solutions here in scenic southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, Ringling Business Solutions helps leadership teams and CEOs develop business plans aligned with digital transformation. I've personally been a CEO or president of a mid-market manufacturing company, several of them for the last 25 years, and had a lot of hands-on experience implementing and, and optimizing ERP. So wonderful to be here, Sam. All right, thank you so much for being here, Phil. Dave, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Sure. Thanks, Sam. Hey, everybody. My name is Dave Chrysler, and I own an operations consulting business, uh, working with owners in the manufacturing, construction, and cannabis spaces, helping them create the systems they need to reclaim their life and grow their business. And I come to you with more than 20 years in the manufacturing space, directly responsible for multiple ERP implementations. Thanks for having me, Sam. Love it. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, Angela, do you want to go next? Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Thurman. I own Thurman Co. in Houston, Texas. Well, we are a project management and supplier assessment company. I have over um, 20 plus years in technical project management, including supplier selection and risk assessment. And I'm uh, happy to be here, Sam. Thank you. Okay, amazing. Andy, do you want to go next? I'd love to, Sam. Uh, my name is Andy Pratico. I've been involved in ERP software uh, for manufacturers for over four decades. I've worked all over the uh, United States and all over Canada. And uh, I actually have published a book on how to evaluate ERP software. And I'm... Tickled to be here today, Sam. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Andy, for the introduction. And we are going to jump right into today's stories. And the very first story that we have is coming from Apicor, guys. Uh, so I don't know whether you guys remember, uh, you know, our discussion when we had the Apicore session, they were working on the Kinetic platform. Uh, so right now, what they have done is they have released a new update to their connected Kinetic platform. I don't know if I recall if they were planning to move their Apicore Profit 21, uh, you know, to cloud or the Kinetic as well, but seems like this is concise with the release of Apicor uh, Profit 21, the cloud platform that they are calling, but I don't know if that has the newer UX that they have, uh, which is what they are calling is Kinetic. Uh, the uh, Profit platform is very well penetrated in the distribution space. Uh, the Kinetic platform is their flagship product that is very well penetrated in the manufacturing space. A um, couple of updates that we saw in some of the uh, news that we try to track in the past couple of weeks. So as part of this update, number one, they have released the integration with KB Max. If you guys remember, it was a very pretty tool. Um, so that's going to be really handy that you know they have been able to integrate and release with the core platform. This is big for Apicore, in my opinion. Then uh, we also saw that they had signed a deal, I believe, during Fabtech. Uh, with the, uh, you know, for the metal uh, fabrication space, uh, the nesting one, and seems like they have been able to release that as well. So maybe they simply announced during the tariff tech, and they were already working on this one before, from before, uh, but seems like it's already part of the release. 
and they also have connections with Amazon and eBay. Uh, I don't know which product they are talking about with these connections or this is going to be part of the core platform where they are going to share these connections. Uh, but seems like Epicor is making really good moves, especially, you know, I'm super excited about their CPQ capabilities and obviously nesting integration is fairly cool as well. Okay, uh, if you guys have any comment, just unmute yourself and uh, we can discuss those. Otherwise, I'm going to move to the next story. And well, the next story that we have- uh, Just very quickly, there's a competitive product called FabTroll that recently has been sunsetted, designed specifically for steel fabrication estimating. So this is a perfect opportunity for Epicor to jump into that new space. I agree. They must be tracking that or they must be watching that. But yeah, I, I agree with your assessment. Okay. Uh, if you don't have any other comments, then the next news is coming from our friends at Zendesk. And guys, uh, you know, this is fairly similar story that we saw in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think we saw Intuit uh, had acquired MailChimp for a lot of money. And we were wondering, okay, why they paid like, I don't know, maybe they paid what, four? Uh, if I, you guys recall the, the figure, $4 billion, billion with the B. Uh, okay, and here now Zendesk has acquired a company called SurveyMonkey, and they have paid, if my understanding is right here, they have paid roughly $3.5 billion. Uh, I don't know if that's what they are saying as part of this news, but when I was reading about this news, I think they did say that they have paid as much. Here they are saying Zendesk expects the acquisition to be growth accretive by 2023 and will accelerate its revenue plan to approximately $3.5 billion by 2024. Here, they are not saying how much money they have paid. They are simply saying that together they are going to be, uh, you know, uh, getting this much revenue by 2024. But I think they paid large chunk of money similar to what Intuit has done. And by the way, guys, this is going to be very similar to the company that we are going to be discussing today, which is going to be, obviously for us, we are going to be discussing the ECI. But the major product that ECI is carrying at this point of time are coming from a company called Exact, okay? And Exact is the similar player in Netherlands, uh, you know, as you have here, a company called Intuit. They have similar corporate model, they have, they have similar corporate strategy. So these companies, what they are trying to do is they are trying to get into the, the CRM space. So you have players like Zoho, you have players like Zendesk, you have players like Intuit. Um, they are trying to do the same thing from the exact perspective. In Europe, they have moved away from the North American market because it's just brutal to compete with, uh, with companies like Intuit. Everybody knows that. Uh, uh, so they are following very different strategies. So here, uh, I'm super excited about Zendesk, especially with this move. Uh, Zendesk has been trying to get into the CRM play for a long time. They used to be more of the customer service app, but now they are going to be able to do the CRM, the marketing automation. And I don't know if their plan is going to be to acquire the accounting and payroll as well. Uh, that becomes the vertical uh, stack for a lot of companies uh, that can take advantage of this. Uh, Sam, I find the term growth accretive by 2023 to be a really interesting term for them. Typically, accretive is used of when an investment is going gonna, is gonna to create a positive net return. So a positive amount of, of profit for a company. Growth accretive implies that in two years, they'll get enough growth out of this to pay for the acquisition. But it's a very unusual way to put a publication out there. I found that fascinating. Yeah, and by the way, I mean, this is, uh, you know, copied from solution review. So I don't know if Zendesk put it like this or it was the translation from solution review, but great point. Great point. Yeah, Sam, and I looked up, it looks like uh, they paid about $4 billion with a B in stock to acquire this. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. And yes, that's a big number for companies like Subway Monkey. But seems like that's been that trend. Whether you talk about Mailchimp and Subway Monkey, had significant market share overall in the email automation space. Uh, it's fascinating, though. I mean, these email marketing marketing automation apps are actually getting this kind of exit. Um, 
Okay, so the next story is coming from Saligo. And guys, if you're not familiar with Saligo, it's the iPaaS. Uh, it's called Integration Platform as a Service. There are many different platforms in the market that compete with Saligo, which is going to be Saligo, Jitterbit, Workado. Uh, you know, you have Dell Boomi. Uh, you have a bunch of tools from Informatica. Uh, then the, the granddaddy, Tipco. Uh, these are some of the players that are in the iPaaS space. Uh, Saligo is the smallest one. They are primarily present in the NetSuite uh, and potentially Acumatica ecosystem. That's their bread and butter. So today they have announced the new capabilities and the new capabilities are very interesting, okay? The way I read it. So here they are saying the products, data warehouse, business process automation, pay out to reconciliation, business process automation. So the way I pass platforms work, they are meant to be more of the technical integration platform so that you don't have to code the boilerplate code for your integration. You are gonna have some sort of connector and the only thing you have to worry about the business logic. Okay, and then you don't have to worry about where it is going to be deployed, how much you are going to pay, how much your Azure or uh, Google is going to charge. So iPaaS actually uh, helps with all of that. But here they are going slightly uh, deeper in their capabilities because they are providing functional capability, which I find a little strange for a platform like Saligo, uh, but maybe they have a play there. Uh, so they seem to have come up with the payout to re uh, reconciliation business process automation. I don't know if this is going to be specific to NetReach uh, or any specific tool, but they are really calling it payout to reconciliation business process automation. Employee onboarding, offboarding business process automation uh, are now available. Uh, here, uh, they are saying that three new solutions will help user automate, uh, source data extraction, reduce time to insights, control cost savings, automatically identify payout dependencies, improve onboarding, streamline offboarding and meet requirements with flexible. Uh, yeah, but again, you know, my perspective of this tool is, this is a technical tool, be technical. Uh, why are you growing these vertical capabilities? Maybe I don't understand, uh, but they are doing something very unique. All right, guys, so if you guys don't have any other comments, we are going to move to today's discussion which is going to be ECI. And guys, if you are not familiar with ECI, I am going to give you a quick brief uh, about how ECI as a company came about, what is their strategy overall from the corporate perspective, what they are doing as of today. So ECI, I find this company mind blowing, especially uh, in the smaller category, because I always want some sort of you know professional investors that should be backing a company when you have an ERP system. That's my personal preference always, just because they are going to be slightly more transparent with respect to their financial position. They are going to have some more experience in managing the risky companies such as software uh, and ERP in my experience is very, very risky. Now, when I look at ECI, I personally could not find any financial statements or anything financially that was publicly available, which was slightly strange when you are uh, a PE owned company, I would expect at least some uh, you know, data available publicly. Their even marketing collateral is very gated. Uh, and it's kind of trickier because of the way they are approaching, most of the product categories that you are going to find, they all have their own strategies in terms of whether they want to get the content or not. Okay, so for example, let's say if you are going to look at some of the products that are targeted for job shop, and we have consistently seen this trend when we reviewed, uh, you know, products like Global Shop or Pro Shop, they had very gated content, right? Uh, the same thing applies for companies like ShopTech, which was acquired by ECI. In case of ECI, that's going to be gated. But if you actually look at Macola, okay, Macola has very good. Uh, you know, documentation, even though both of these products are owned by ECI as a company. Now, let's look at some of the, 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 the overall philosophy of the company. So, uh, and Andy, you can probably correct me. I, I believe until 2016, they didn't have as many products as they have today. Today, they have more than 30 products in their portfolio. In last three or four years, I believe they have acquired more than 15 products. Okay, uh, so I think this started somewhere in 2017. Uh, they became one of the most aggressive overall in terms of their acquisition strategy. 
obviously we have seen acquisition in case of Epicor, Infor, uh, you name it, APN, you know, they all acquire a lot of companies. But what we have seen in case of ECI is extremely unusual in my experience. And the reason for that is because they are buying a lot of parallelly competing products. I mean, they compete with each other and they, what they are trying to do as the corporate entity is they have very retail mindset and they are trying to create the individual company. The way they acquired three uh, different ERP systems from their, uh, you know, the other seller called Exact, which is a very big player uh, in Europe and they bought three different companies. Okay, those are still very independent companies. The only changes ECI has made is they have shared the resources among them. So now uh, from the corporate uh, strategy perspective, all of these companies are going to be the individual entity, even though they have sort of the marketing division, they have the industrial division where they have the reporting structure that, you know what, you guys are going to be reporting to manufacturing versus building automation versus the office products. Uh, but still, uh, you know, they don't really have the compensation structure that is going to be centralized. They don't really, they might have the financial reporting, which is going to be centralized, but operationally, they are completely, completely independent. Their background is very e-commerce. They started as e-commerce, uh, you know, player. And in my experience, the e-commerce companies don't have very deep understanding of how the accounting and the ERP systems are supposed to work. After their acquisition of some of the robust products such as Macola and ShopTech, they really got a taste of, uh, you know, the, the products that are going to be slightly more accounting and the operations heavy. But before that, it was, you know, very e-commerce, very POS kind of feel if you look at the majority of the products. The majority of the companies that they acquired they had very deep e-commerce capabilities. That was their bread and butter. For them, the strategy was to sort of build the same strategy that let's say Epicor is trying to build or Infor is trying to build in key verticals, but these guys are better QuickBooks is how I like to see it or how I have seen, okay? So if, in case of QuickBooks, you have to buy Fishbowl for manufacturing. In case of ECI, uh, you know, let's say if you go for ECI, then uh, let's say if you are a building contractor or you are a paint shop or you are a print shop or you are a very small job shop, then you can go to ECI and they'll probably give you a product that is going to work out of the box. Uh, but obviously you are going to face a lot of challenges because the support is not centralized, because the resources are not centralized, the code base is fairly duplicated. So they, they need a lot of dollars to be able to maintain all of this code base. And then who is going to invest in 30 different products to be able to modernize this to cloud native, it's just very expensive process. Uh, and uh, by the way, 30 is going to be just the number of products. Each of them are probably going to have 10 different versions because you have to support all of them. So now we are talking about 30 times 10, 300 different code bases. Can you guys believe this? That's a massive, massive investment. I don't know a company on the face of this earth that can support that kind of massive investment to be able to innovate what ECI is looking for. Even the companies that actually grew because of acquisition, for example, Infor or Epicor, they are trying to consolidate their portfolio. The biggest challenge for them has been so far is how can I move my customers that I acquired, let's say, you know, whatever uh, outdated platform they might be using right now, they are not able to switch them to the strategic product that they really want to move forward. It's been terribly challenging for them. I don't know how ECI is going to be able to do that. There is no way they can they can sustain these many products and the code bases. And I don't know how they are going to consolidate the portfolio when companies like Infor and Apicor are having this challenge as well. Say, Sam, I, I think on this particular company, and I'll come back to this point in several slides later when we talk about their ownership structure through the lens of developing a comprehensive ERP solution. It doesn't look doable and it, and it doesn't look normal or typical in the standpoint of how a private equity fund views a business and exit and how the next private equity fund might view that business and potential value and exit. I think that makes more sense. And I'll come back to that point a little deeper in a future slide. 
Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, I mean, see, I forgot to mention one point, which is going to be the last investor that actually started this trend had acquired roughly 15 companies and they have had 4x exit within four years. Even for the software industry, four years is a very short time span doing that kind of acquisition. So you have done all of this and now you moved away. Now the next investor is probably going to have similar perspective that I acquired. Now I am looking for a similar amount of investment. Number one, where are they going to find these many companies? Number two, how can you create so much value that you are looking at, you know, 4x before and now you are looking for same kind of return. In case of ERP company, you require slightly uh, more sophisticated investor who can invest in the long term health of the company than simply playing with the transactional mindset. Okay, so if you guys don't have any other comments, I am actually going to talk about the first slide. So here, they started in 1999, okay, as the e-commerce shop. Now, this would be similar to, I think, Info, Info started in roughly, what, 2003? So these guys really started as the e-commerce player. And if you look at their acquisition strategy, the product philosophy, their philosophy is still very e-commerce-y, okay? We are going to talk about all of that. Now... Uh, until 2017, I don't think they had a lot of foothold overall, uh, you know, in the ERP category, but, you know, they had a product, they had a couple of products uh, that they were selling, but after 2017, they became really aggressive. Uh, their go-to-market verticals are similar to Apicor, uh, but, you know, based on my understanding of Apicor strategy, Apicor likes to fill the holes, okay? They are not trying to create 30 different code base. They are trying to buy the, the add-ons that can sit on top of their core ERP as opposed to, uh, you know, buying 30 different ERP. So there is a huge difference between what Apicor is trying to do versus what ECI is trying to do. Uh, now, they already have 30 products and 20 locations. And when they say 20 locations, these are, my understanding is that these are 20 different legal entities. If you actually go to their website, even the website is not centralized. Okay, sometimes it, 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 gets, it gets very, very confusing. Okay, so when I was trying to look at, okay, what have they done for Macola? Okay, they had uh, many options for Macola, but I had no idea that if I want to learn about Macola, then I actually have to physically go to Macola site to be able to find out what is happening with the product, or I would have completely missed everything about that product because there was no sort of correlation of where that product is. When I looked at their website, it was very, very, very chaotic, to be honest, because I could not really find, okay, how these products are going to fit in which market for which size. Uh, they had a little bit of description of the industries, but there is a massive overlap uh, in terms of the industries that they are targeting from the product perspective. Okay, so here, this is the bottom, uh, you know, many that they have, and they have, you know, these are different products that they have acquired. A lot of them have very, 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 uh, you know, duplicate functionality. They overlap with each other. Uh, the industries that they have targeted, uh, you know, they are saying manufacturing, uh, home and building supply, they do really, really well. Again, these are the same industries that even, uh, you know, Apicor is trying to target and they are trying to buy uh, the similar products uh, in, in, in that space. Now, uh, if you look at the top menu here, I thought maybe, you know what, uh, and again, I don't know if this is really, uh, this is not alphabetical, so Angela, you can be happy about it, I guess, uh, that it was not alphabetical. So in my case, what I really wanted to see is, okay, so when you have the many positioning from the top, my uh, perspective is going to be job boss as your go-to product. Okay, because that is the first menu option. And then the other three are tilted towards the right. So I am going to think that these are going to be, uh, you know, probably sunsetted because you don't care for these products. That's why you have sort of created the sub bullet. I don't know why you would create a sub bullet for the, uh, for the product. So my understanding, and this is how Oracle had done if you actually look at their menu structure. Okay, so they act, what they had done for their own prime product, on-prem products were on the side. They didn't want to highlight them. Uh, it was created as more as the sub-menu. And the main menu was Netflix, Oracle ERP. Those are the two products that they really wanted to uh, go after. So based on this, I would think that, you know what? Macola is probably going away because they don't care for Macola. Okay. Uh, Job Boss is the on-prem product. And they have positioned Job Boss and Macola at the similar level. So, uh, you know, and, and they have the cloud native product, which is called Job Boss 2. That's why Job Boss 2 is the go-to you know, product for them. 
So they are obviously, uh, you know, sunsetting the job boss product. But does that mean that are they also sunsetting the cola? Are they also sun Max? Definitely. I, I can almost guarantee that they are going to kill Max product. <laughs> okay, uh, because there is no way in the hell they are going to be able to carry these products. Okay, but Makola is a very developed ecosystem overall, and they had promised uh, to Makola customers that Makola is not going anywhere. We are, uh, you know, investing in Makola, and that was the understanding that we got from the from the partners uh, as well as from the customers. But based on the menu structure, it does seem like they are probably going to be, um, you know, killing Makola uh, as well as Max. But I. Yeah, well, wait a second, Sam. It says at the bottom that Maco that Max is rock solid, so you know it's going to be around for a while. Uh, are they the same product, Andy? Do you know by any chance? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, that's they well, call well, it rock and, solid. And let's challenge, now. yeah, let's challenge that premise just a little bit. Is this structure that they have because those are three customer links, or which is a subset? or that structure here because they're downgrading those two products. I don't know that's as clear as you're saying, Sam. Yeah, exactly. I could not follow that either. So I don't know what is the rationale why they have created it this way. Uh, but you know, if you are positioning an on-prem product at the same level as Makola, obviously you are going to be killing Job Boss. That's why you are trying to promote Job Boss too, because that's your go-to cloud-native product. It makes sense, right? But you are positioning Makola as well. At the similar level, so I just don't get it. I mean, are you trying to kill Makola as well? Maybe, maybe there, not. There's a know. lot of overlap with all those systems. Yeah. So I am actually going to move to the next slide. So here, when you look at their manufacturing section, and I was trying to find out, okay, you have 30 products. Uh, you know, a lot of them are positioned for manufacturing. So how are you going to position when, let's say, if a customer is going to come to you? Uh, you know, it's all over the place. When you read, for example, let's say, if you look at the Job Boss product, okay? So they are saying it's for job shops make to order manufacturers okay so this is not guys this is supposed make to order when you say this is going to be slightly more complex bombs as opposed to your make to stock or you know repetitive manufacturing from the product perspective the products are going to be slightly easier they are going to be slightly more volume manufacturing that you see let's say in case of automotive so if you look at the shop tech shop tech is positioned for repetitive and discrete manufacturer so my mind is going to be, okay, so if you are saying ECI E2 shop tech towards the right, meaning this is probably going to be comparable to your Plex market because Plex likes to play in that specific market. Now, Job Boss, Job Boss is going to be your, uh, you know, pro shop or, uh, you know, uh, your global shop market. Uh, in fact, if you actually look at uh, the E2 product, okay, the way it was positioned in the market, it has similar marketing strategy, similar strategy as Global Shop. But here, they are positioning Shop Tech as more of the Plex market when it was clearly positioned to be the competitor of Global Shop before the acquisition. But here, something seems to be changed, so I don't know if they are clear about that. But now, Sam, Sam yeah? that's, that's Job Boss too. Yes. Okay, so they claim that this is going to support the semiconductor market. No, well, that's a marketing <laughs> pitch. And uh, I mean, the the the, um, the, you know, the semi standards for the semiconductor market that's that's a huge no, um, no, it's not. take. No, no, I I completely agree, Angela. The job the job boss two or job boss squared or whatever that is that's a, a recent merger of two of their products. And it's what Sam was talking about consolidation. Uh, they had another product called E2 shop, not E2 manufacturing, but E2 shop and another one called job boss, which they merged. And now it come out as their windows tool called job boss two or squared or whatever it is. So, but yeah. Uh, so I, I am not sure if that is true, Andy, because, uh, you know, when I actually look at the, the shop tech acquisition, that yep. came to them in 2020, okay? So so they are still carrying that product. That, you know, when you actually go to link for E2, you can see that, okay? But if you are saying that, you know what, you killed the shop tech product, okay? You killed the on-prem because shop tech is very on-prem in nature. Now right. you are positioning the job shop two. Job shop two is not gonna fly because job. If you look at the job shop two screens, it's very quick books looking screens. Okay, 
shop tech was a very robust product like global shop okay yes. when you look at global shop it was a Correct. very deep product overall from the functionality perspective so i don't know how job shop 2 is going to be a replacement for for e2 uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All, all I can tell you is the companies that have already migrated tell me that the Job Boss 2 system is very similar in functionality, not look and feel. Look and feel is different, but very functional uh, as far as E2 Shop, their previous system that you're describing. Um, okay. There isn't a lot of difference, they say, in functionality is the same. Uh, that will be very interesting. We need to look deeper into that and let's look at some of these things and then we'll uh, we'll we'll take a look at that if that is true or not. Uh, but one of the comments that I am going to make on this screen is going to be, they have acquired companies like Decom, which was very innovative, very new company. It was the, the, the feel of the product is going to be almost similar to Pack Imagina. Okay, and then you acquire a very clunky product in roughly in the same year, <laughs> which is going to be your shop tech, E2. Like super ugly, super on-prem technology, very clunky. So what are you trying to do? I don't get it. And you are trying to position both of these products when you say E2 manufacturing, you say Decom, Job Boss 2, and M1, um, you know, that you are still trying to sell all of this. So what is your acquisition strategy? Are you trying to go after the coolest technology or are you trying to acquire these companies and your goal is going to be to kill some of these clunky technologies so what exactly are you trying to do from the acquisition perspective is not entirely clear to me. A couple quick points on that one, Sam, because I think that question is a key question. First of all, their website isn't giving you clarity on this. So part of the problem, and, and as Andy said, there's so much overlap on these between them, it's hard to figure out which one that they're trying to apply to what. So it it, it looks again like, like the business strategy is, is what's driving this, not an IT strategy. And the business strategy may be, and this is just my opinion, is the business strategy is to acquire customer groups that are using these solutions. And then the next owner's value proposition will be to drive those customers to more common, less populous software. So this strategy is to come up with all of these customer segments and all of this stuff, 30 products, and that's how they'll make their money. The next guy is gonna say, I can consolidate this. I can consolidate these 30 products down to a group. I can maybe do what you said, save costs by consolidating all the software support functionality within the business. And then I have the customers now, I'll sell them the new solutions. So it almost, it's a business strategy that has two parts. That I, I'm those, that's just an opinion from looking at how they are, but that would make sense. Yeah, I agree. So, guys, uh, you know, now let's look at the E2 solution that you were trying to, uh, you know, describe, Andy. So here, this is still the shop tech site is still up. This is the acquisition from 2020, and they are trying to commercialize the E2 solution. When you are going to click on the E2 solution, it's going to go to your shop tech site. And the way it is positioned, it's the same positioning as your global shop, if you guys remember. Okay, it's it's very similar the way you know they have constructed their menu, the way they have um, you know mentioned every single shop out there you know <laughs> under the sun. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just from the lead generation perspective, I get it, right? That and they have very similar. Even their content is gated. So shop tech and my understanding was that shop tech was competing head to head with global shop, but then ECI ended up acquiring shop tech. So now, you know, I don't know. And Andy, you are saying that they are going to kill this product and they are going to commercialize the Job, uh, job Boss 2 product. Uh, again, I don't think they are similar in capabilities. We'll show you in the screenshot how low or lean the functionality is in, in the Job Shop 2 product. It's really designed for the customers who are not happy with QuickBooks. They are not able to do the manufacturing. So they should be using job uh, the Job Boss product. But when you look at, uh, you know, products like Global Shop, I know companies that could be as big as, I don't know, uh, eight, $10 million, they can easily run uh, on Global Shop, even though they should be moving from them because obviously you are going to grow out of that and it's not going to be able to support the transaction volume that your company is going to require. But, you know, it has the functionality to be able to support um, the inventory, MRP, uh, et cetera, as part of the product. 
so Sam, I, I want to again mention the the selection of um, perspective industries that is represented here. The difference between an assembly shop or a fabrication shop and a circuit board manufacturer is so wide. I just can't imagine putting them in the same bucket and saying, this ERP system is going to fit both of you. A circuit board manufacturer has to conform to ICP standards. And um, that is things like ensuring that the chemicals in your plant are properly stored and uh, inventoried on a FIFO basis that you've used the correct packaging, you've, you've, you've soldered the boards to J standards and that every one of your assemblers has been certified, maintained their certification. Um, I don't see this um, being captured in an ERP system very um, regularly and unless it's an extremely robust ERP system. Don't forget perception marketing is reality <laughs> good point good point andy so so angela is is that because they're not showing you more detail on how they're doing it or do you see something here that just really makes you skeptical about what they are showing you so are you kind of being skeptical because they're not showing you because like you said this would have to be very robust to accomplish that it would have to be a very robust system to capture all of that so, so you're being skeptical that that could exist. It's not that they could, and they obviously did not prove that to you with what they provided. I did, I did not see it on their website. But again, I didn't, I didn't, because as Sam said, everything is gated. I did not provide my uh, contact information to get access to all the demos and so forth. Maybe it's there if I had done that. But um, my initial review of the website did not indicate that information is there. So just to be clear, guys, you know, some of these compliance requirements, even in the larger systems, you have to build it, uh, you know, even though if they might claim that they are going to support it out of the box, um, that may not be possible even in case of larger systems. But overall, from the targeting and positioning perspective, shop tech was positioned as the product that could support complex manufacturing. So when you look at the positioning of Apicor in four, uh, you know, the way they like to position themselves as, hey, whatever kind of manufacturing you have, I've got you covered. But that is not, uh, you know, what they are not trying to say is if you are going to go to your semiconductor, I may not have the compliance requirement that you might have for your industry that you have to probably still build uh, on top of the core platform. So ShopTech had similar positioning overall from the product perspective. Uh, but obviously that is not targeted for the kind of companies that Apicor or Infor is trying to target. We need to be absolutely clear that this is really the QuickBooks, you know, global shop, pro shop kind of space. The comparable is not going to be Apicor or Infor because they are much bigger product. They are much bigger product overall in their capabilities in housing the transactions that you would need when you are going to be 15, 20, 30, uh, you know, uh, $50 million company. Okay. Well, Sam, if. <laughs> If, if that's the kind of system that, that I was building, producing, and selling, I would not say, hey, I'm here for you, semiconductor market and circuit board market. Okay, fair point, Angela. Okay, so I am actually gonna move on just in the interest of time. So here we have the office uh, you know, technology market, and this is a very unique market, guys. Okay, they have acquired some of the really, really cool products. Uh, you know, I saw a product called DDMS. It was fairly successful with the office dealers, and it's a fairly cool product. All customers love it. So obviously, they are going after some of the coolest products that were loved by these smaller companies because they could not get what they were looking for from their business operations perspective in products like QuickBooks or you know, with add-ons on top of QuickBooks. So they used to love it a lot. So they have a lot of different platform, but guys, if you actually pay attention to the screenshot, okay, of the way their sales orders are, the way their, uh, you know, sales order screen is, the way their part screen is, you will get QuickBooks feeling. You will not get ERP feeling, okay? So these all products were designed for QuickBooks market 
It's just that they had the industry flavor, okay, for those markets on top of QuickBooksy apps. <laughs> Uh, so pay attention to the screenshot. So here they are saying that, you know what, I can, uh, you know, work with the office equipment dealers, point of sale providers, uh, you know, office equipment dealers here, many service providers, you know, the many service provider space is, is very unique as well, to be honest. Uh, you know, the way their business processes are, it's, it's very, very, very different. Um, you have value added resellers, you have office technology providers, um, their business processes are very different. And that's why the, the product does well in that space. Uh, then this is the product that I was talking about. DDMS is is, is fairly successful product uh, overall in the in the office space. Um, you have the Red Falcon. <laughs> Look at the the number of products that they have, and this is targeted for GSA contract holders. You have IT consumable dealers, but that could have a lot of overlap with the DDMS as well. And the other one we just saw uh, overall from the positioning perspective, they have very unique capability for art suppliers. Uh, <laughs> It just, uh, you know, a lot of uh, unique uh, industries uh, that a lot of vanilla ERP may not be able to support, especially in the QuickBooks market. So kudos to them that they are really acquiring all of these products. Uh, then you have the contract office furniture space. Now, this is a very tricky space as well, guys. The way their business pro uh, you know, processes are, because, uh, you know, you are going to have these drawings, you have the consumers that are looking at the project, and then, oh, my goodness, uh, it's, a, it's a very different market vertical, uh, like real estate. So they have a product for that market. But again, guys, this is not the ERP system. You need to keep this in mind. They have designed these products from the e-commerce workflow perspective, okay? For them, everything is a website. It's not really the ERP system. When you get into the real supply chain, when you get into the real operations, when you get into the real MRP planning, when you get into the real inventory planning, that's where these systems are going to fall short. They are going to have all of the bullet points. Hey, multi-facilities, I can support it. Sure, you can do that, but you are designed for the franchise model where you are going to have two different restaurants as part of your McDonald's uh, umbrella. It is not designed for the manufacturing company where you are going to have site one in the US and you know another one in Canada. It is not designed for those kind of businesses. So pay attention to the, the way they are positioning. Sometimes it could be very misleading for the customer. They are going to say, you know what? My job boss is the multi-site, multi-company product. <laughs> it is not, guys. Uh, okay, there's a lot, you know, significant difference uh, in terms of what a real uh, multi-entity solution is. Okay, uh, this is also a very tricky space in my mind. Uh, you know, uh, each WEC uh, contractors is, is very, very unique overall in terms of the way their business processes are. So again, they have a thermal grid. Uh, if you look at the screenshot again, we don't have the screenshot of these products, uh, but you are going to have very similar feeling, uh, just like QuickBooks. Uh, and then we have the home and building supply. Guys, this is a very unique vertical. Uh, even the uh, the mainstream ERPs fail uh, in uh, spaces such as land development. Their business processes are very different. Uh, they have the unique entity for each of the projects that they acquire uh, and then very different processes. So again, even if a product is available in that market, that itself is a uh, is a huge accomplishment for this company. Uh, but again, if you look at the, the screenshot of the product, you are going to get the feeling that it is going to be QuickBooks. And by the way, if you guys remember, you know, we actually blasted companies like ProShop and uh, companies like Global Shop because of their technology, okay? But these companies are significantly functionally rich. They might not be doing things right, okay? But they have the bells and whistles. <laughs> Uh, to be able to support the core ERP function, uh, even though from the product perspective, they might not be ERP. But if you actually look at the, the products from uh, ECI, the majority of them, you don't get the feel of the ERP. You get the feel as if they are more of either the e-commerce app uh, or, you know, my friend Andy likes to call POS. Uh, they can do accounting, but it's, it's, it's very limited. Okay. Uh, this is also for the, uh, you know, land developers. But I mean, if you actually look at these companies, to be honest, when you look at the lot management on your, uh, on your mobile phone, right? I mean, that's a big deal, guys. And this is what these guys like to do. They are going to 
give you a very attractive pitch uh, based on their product because you can do the land development on mobile, but my SAP guys are not able to do that. Okay, so they are going to claim that I am probably bigger than SAP. <laughs> no, no, you are not. Uh, uh, you are simply trying to uh, position the product in a way to attract these immature buyers because they don't really have uh, you know, as much experience in buying ERP, doing supply chain planning, uh, doing inventory planning, doing MRP. So your target market is going to be very QuickBooks, less than $5 million probably, you know, maybe six, seven, but not more than that. Okay, so here is the comparison of uh, different products that we were talking about. So here, uh, Andy, this is the uh, product that we have for M1. This is the screenshot from their site right now, okay? The down below is the ShopTech product. And these two, as you can clearly see, these are very on-prem product. Now, look at the screenshot of Job Boss here. Uh, you know, these are the screenshot of the Job Boss. And if you look at the, the number of fields that you have in the grid, and I believe this is this is the estimate. Okay, if you are going to look at decent size ERP system, the you know you are going to have probably fifty fields. <laughs> These guys have four fields, and that's what QuickBooks has. Okay, here even if you look at the E2 Shop Tech. Okay, here the number of fields that you are going to have are probably going to be 20, 25. Okay, because Shop Tech was the product that was competing with. Uh, with Global Shop, and they had decent functionality to be able to support the manufacturing of a small manufacturing company. But there is no way Job Boss 2 can do that. Even though it's a fairly cool product overall from the uh, you know technology perspective, it has a very QuickBooks Odoo kind of feeling. Odoo would be probably comparable, uh, you know, with them. Uh, Odoo probably is going to be slightly richer uh, in terms of the functionality that we saw, uh, but you know, Job Boss is even smaller. Now, uh, and now I don't know. I mean, see, obviously they cannot carry this UI and, uh, you know, this look and feel of the product. They have to convert this into the ECI and the, this is the DCOM feeling, guys. Uh, as you can see, DCOM is a very new product. It almost feels as if you are using some sort of iPhone. <laughs> uh, and this is what bothers me that, you know, in 2020, you are buying a very clunky technology. And in 2021, you have bought one of the most innovative products. Uh, it's small, but it's the technology is very cool. It's very, very, very small uh, overall uh, from the size perspective. But you know the way it is done, the way the development is done is is amazing uh, in GCOM. There's no question about that. I think all of that presents a, a challenge, Phil, kind of to your point about, you know, potential uh, business strategy in terms of consolidating some of these customers into new technology. You know, you think about the UI and what people are used to seeing and a major change from something that feels very uh, desktopy to what the new technology is. And that's going to probably result in some uh, unhappy customer reviews would be my guess. And in a big challenge from a, a technology and implementation standpoint. The, the future challenge there, David, is going to be extreme. It, it This almost looks to me like they excused all the IT people out of the room when they made their decision <laughs> what they were going to buy. <laughs> and guys, one more thing. I mean, you know, from the development perspective, you know, it's not that all of these products are really built in the same technology. They are probably going to be using a lot of different databases. They are going to be using different programming languages. So how are you going to keep this talent? Even for the consulting company, that is very, very hard. Okay, you are a product company. <laughs> you are supposed to be consolidating everything under one uh, technology footprint so that it's all easier. It's cheaper in maintaining your resources. Uh, this one is, is just hard. So in case yeah, of- it, But in a very serious way, Sam, excuse me, the, uh, the customers that are on these products and using them or adding them there, there's a future day of reckoning, especially if uh, if the company decides that they're going to consolidate into a couple common type of platforms in each of these spaces. Uh, tran transitioning off of a product like this onto something else that's completely different is a major lift for their customer base. So you got to be weary going into this, even if they have a long term solution that solves this issue. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy for their customers to get to that upgrade. 
exactly i completely agree and in fact i mean see they should be slightly clearer to their customers because that's not fair to the customers if you are not telling them you know which products are going to be killed in next four or five years um, you are you know ethically supposed to say that uh, if you ask them i am almost sure that they are going to say you know what i am moving forward with everything because that's what their marketing is telling but it's not fair to the customer who's buying an erp today and you know after a year you are going to announce you know what i am actually killing that product think of the amount of investment that you have to do on top of these products in making sure that they are able to comply with those industries uh, you know amount of custom development and by the way they are running this with their own professional services so you don't even have a choice let's say you uh, don't want to listen to uh, eci and you simply want to work with somebody outside uh, to be able to maintain that product you don't even have that choice they are going to give you a timeline i am going to give you 6 months are you moving out or you are not moving out if you are not moving out you lose all of your data can you believe this so it's going to be this bad uh, you know from the corporate strategy perspective i don't know if they are going to do that but that's a possibility if they are not being crystal clear in terms of what their product strategy is which products are they going to be committing to and which products they are not going to be uh, committing to by the way guys uh, one key feature and you when you are going to look at these uh, these products they are going to have very specific uh, you know needs that are going to be uh, you know that will resonate with the first time buyers okay for example i have personally never heard of a term called route accounting and i actually try to dig a little bit into that so the way the route accounting works is so let's say if you are going to carry all of your products uh, in a vehicle uh, or a truck and you are actually trying to sell from that so say, visualize ice cream truck and that is the space they are trying to operate in to be honest from the target market perspective so think ice cream truck guys so what ice cream truck does is you know they have to sell the ice cream as they move along on the road and then they have to make sure that they are able to count the inventory now this is a very pos functionality it is not even accounting because most of the the companies and the customer that i have personally seen whatever happens in your e-commerce whatever happens in your pos you know i am going to release the inventory towards the beginning of the day do something come back and tell me what you sold and i am actually going to be doing the accounting for that i don't have time to count every single ice cream as you are selling uh, you know so now they are positioning that i can do the route accounting now if you actually compare some of the e-commerce platforms papri is a very robust e-commerce platforms from uh, you know israel and they are don't claim themselves as the erp eci is actually claiming themselves as the erp but they have all of the this functionality they are going to have your gps they are going to have your route compliance they are going to have your trade promotion they are going to have inventory management in fact if you actually remember the the epicor acquisition of the paint shop in that they had the 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 purchase order capabilities they had a little bit of counting from the inventory management perspective right but that is very pos centric fun functionality but these guys are actually trying to sell as the accounting app when it should be really the pos or the e-commerce app uh, in my mind okay uh one of the things guys uh, you know they have one of the most beautiful solution okay called macola uh and i was almost going to miss this because i had no idea uh, you know how to find it i was looking at their website and i had no idea where macola is right now if you actually look at macola to be honest macola came from a company called exact and exact is a very 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 reputable developer okay of the apps they are almost like into it okay they have, if you look at the quality of their products all of them are are amazing uh, you look at job boss the reason why job boss looks so good is because you hire quality developers you hire quality architects it's going to have very different feeling now if you are going to look at your shop tech shop tech hire a bunch of local guys who didn't know what they were doing so obviously it's probably going to look very ugly <laughs> so this macola product is almost comparable to cispro can you believe this guys cispro has only one product you don't need 30 products to serve your customers you can build flavors to serve these uh, you know industries to be able to, to to be able to serve all of them you didn't have to buy 30 different products to be able to support them but for some reason <laughs> macola is actually downplayed overall the way the website is is uh, you know positioned but the other products are are very well highlighted uh, the way they are approaching the market now we are 
going to look at uh, you know some of the news and the uh, press releases that they have done so one of the things that i want you guys to focus on where these products came from and what was their rationale to kill some of these products or the division i mean when companies like to sell they don't sell for fun i mean they are trying to sell for a reason because they are either trying to streamline consolidate their portfolio or are trying to align the target market where they have the maximum chances of winning so in case of exact the reason why they got rid of these products because they saw the trend that in the consumerized space for example when you have companies like intuit the erp play was not going to work you have very self serve model that's how intuit app is you are talent that is supporting these products so it was really a misfit for them overall from the product perspective that's why they got rid of uh, you know uh, products like macola job boss and max and they gave it to and by the way they also felt threatened in the us market because in the us market they were competing with companies like intuit which they could not from netherlands that's why they wanted to get rid of that so uh, you know from their corporate strategy perspective it makes complete sense how they wanted to actually penetrate the market but from ecri perspective it still does not make any sense why they actually wanted to buy so many competing duplicate products and what they are trying to do with them uh from the corporate strategy perspective uh the eci uh, somehow uh, you know uh, increased their number to roughly what uh, 22000 obviously you acquired a lot of uh, you know smaller products they had uh, you know larger customer base so your numbers are going to look very high and that's probably the reason why the uh, your investor actually got the very high return uh, you know overall in terms of the investment and it's saying that since 2017 eci has made 15 acquisitions helping it gain significant market share and scale internationally with sizable transactions in europe australia consolidating its presence in those regions and now, you just you just answered your previous question sam their their goal was that their goal was to to use money that they had in order to do acquisitions so they could get X amount of customers, 22,000 customers that were on the platform. That was the primary reason they were doing it. Not whether it doesn't appear, whether all those products were going to go together and be a cohesive offering someday. It was to get, is to get that type of market power. Yeah. And, and then, and then sell. And Phil, if you actually watch their videos, the way they have, and I watch some of the videos of their executives and what they are trying to claim is they are going to have slightly different strategy than exact. So what exact did they, I think the exact also acquired these companies from somewhere. I'm not too sure about that because I could not find those details. So the B exact had them structured. These were independent companies under exact and they did not really have any sort of shared resources. So they are keeping the same structure. The only difference is that now they are sharing the best practices. So this is going to be, you know, your McDonald model. Okay, in case of retail, it works great because you are sharing your marketing, branding, you are sharing your recipe, I get it. But it does not work in case of software development because software development is extremely expensive. Okay, it's very expensive to maintain these versions, guys. You have no idea how expensive software development is. And again, going back to the background of these investors, I personally could not find if any of them had background of building either Epicore or Encore or SAP, none of the investors had that background. So I don't know what their thought process is, but if the last investor actually did Forex, what are the odds that the next investor is going to do Forex? And what are the odds after, <laughs> after that? So I don't know what if this strategy is really sustainable uh, from the corporate strategy perspective. Well, and Sam, just to put the, the the impact number is not is not a four times multiple. The impact number is a fifty five percent internal rate of return. That's a home run number. Yeah. And the thing about uh, IRR is it's a time sensitive thing. So the longer that you keep an asset, the harder it is to get an internal rate of return number that's high. Uh, Thirty percent IRR are, are are nice numbers. Fifty five is a beautiful number. Now maybe not for them. I don't know what their goal was. But they, you know, they Apex knew what they were doing. They they put their money in and they got it out. So financially, if you actually do this, this makes complete sense. I get it. 
But as a customer, <laughs> would it make sense for you? If you software companies are not supposed to be, you know, operated the way investors operate in the traditional business, it's a very different business model, guys. It requires very long-term commitment to be able to build on these technologies because if you want to port all of these products in the cloud native technology, it's a massive investment. You cannot take quarterly approach for software development. I don't know. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't know how you are, are going to take the quarterly approach, uh, you know, with the, the transformations. Typically, you are going to have 10 years plan. <laughs> well, and that's, what, and that's what I think is fascinating about this when we look at the, the current owner, the next owner, of where they're from and what they're going to do. It's going to be fascinating. Exactly, exactly. So guys, some more details here overall, uh, you know, in terms of their journey. Uh, so this is uh, the ShopTech acquisition and this was the Connecticut uh, based and they were targeting, as you can see here, they were targeting the job shops and make to order. And now if you actually look at their positioning, the way ECI has changed their positioning in the other slide, they are saying this is for uh, the repetitive because now I have another product that is going to be, uh, you know, positioned for the, uh, for the job shop. So originally, shop tech product was really positioned in the same category as your global shop pro shop because that was their target market. That's how they operated. Uh, you know, it was a very uh, you know comparable company. But now they have changed the the positioning of the product for some reason. So either uh, they didn't know who they were selling to because the product was supposed to be sold to <laughs> you know repetitive manufacturing, or these guys don't know what they are doing. So I don't know <laughs> what is going on here. Um, Okay, uh, so here you have the coating, scheduling, purchasing, shipping, accounting, allow them to run their business more efficiently and profitably. ShopTech will join ECI's manufacturing division, which serves small to medium sized discrete manufacturers and job shops worldwide. They are extremely clear here, but if you actually go to the new positioning from ECI's perspective, they are saying, no, 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 no. ShopTech is not for that. Okay, I have my job boss for that market. Okay, I am actually gonna. If you want, uh, if you are in the repetitive market, then I'm gonna sell you shop tech. So I don't know. I mean, there must be a lot of competition uh, among their teams, you know, uh, because these companies are completely different. Now, here, uh, you know, some more news about that return uh, that Phil was mentioning. So Apex Partners has pocketed a return multiple of over four times. Okay, the exit has also generated and the 55% return that you were talking about, Phil, uh, which is, I agree, it's a home run from the finance perspective. Uh, but again, I have never seen this aggressive strategy with any software company, even with the companies that were super aggressive with their acquisition. Uh, Apex first invested uh, in the company in 2017. By the way, it's not that, I mean, they had the minority share. They sat on the company for 16 years before they, uh, you know, went full blown the way Coke did for Infor. You know, they had no idea what they were doing. They came in 2017. I'm going to math in it's on the spreadsheet. I'm going to get this return and I'm going to walk out in four years. <laughs> so financially, this is, this is brilliant. Uh, you know, it's wonderful. But, you know, from the product and customer perspective, uh, it's questionable. Uh, uh, today, the company, which has, uh, you know, 1,700 employees, serves over 22,000 customers uh, globally across its offices. You know, the acquirer, uh, the Leonard Green, was not immediately available for comment. Uh, this is the LA firm. Again, when I uh, researched on these guys, I could not see that they had any sort of software experience uh, in the investment firm perspective. Uh, none of their investment were, uh, you know, related to this. They wanted to acquire... Uh, more of the e-commerce companies, I guess, or the fast-growing companies. Uh, that was their philosophy, uh, but I don't believe they had really, uh, they had any experience in building these software companies. I, I looked for that. I didn't see it either, Sam. Um, Leonard Green looks to be a uh, retail-focused uh, private equity fund, uh, 50, 60 billion, decent-sized fund, but I couldn't find it doesn't mean that doesn't exist, but I could not find any software investments that they had made. Exactly. So now uh, let's look at some more, uh, you know, things about exact. And I always like to look at, OK, uh, when the buyer and seller both are moving from the market, everybody has their own perspective. Obviously, they are going to be super positive because they don't want to hurt their positioning. But you can read between the lines in terms of what exact is doing and why they are selling. So here, this is the uh, you know press release from exact. And here they had said that, you know, Exact had 
has sold the three U.S. subsidiaries in its specialized solution division to global technology company ECI Software Solution. The division, which consists of U.S. subsidiaries, the Makola, and by the way, these are the products that are really pretty, guys. These are really good products. If you look at the quality of the Makola solution, it's brilliant. It's amazing. It's phenomenal the way it is built. By the way, it is actually built over Microsoft platform. Can you believe this? And that is the only product uh, that in their portfolio is actually built on top of SQL Server. So if you look at the, the quality of the Makola development, because again, when Exact is going to develop the same solution, it's going to have very different quality uh, you know, of the development, but it's not going to be same uh, for your shop tech. In fact, ECI M1 is a fairly outdated solution in my mind. Uh, you know, it's nowhere close to be comparable to your, your Macola. Uh, now, here, all of the three, three products, and including your job boss. Job boss is a beautiful, organized, you know, when you look at it, it feels good, even though it is positioned for the QuickBooks market, but it is at least organized overall from the product perspective. Now, look at the business model of Exact. They have never positioned themselves as the mid-market company. They are 2,000 employee company, guys. Okay, they are probably as big as Intuit, uh, you know, or they are in the similar category. They never claim that they serve mid-market. My friends at ECI are claiming that they are, are serving mid-market. In my mind, that's not true at all. Okay, they, their products are designed for really small companies for the QuickBooks segment. The only difference with ECI is going to have, they are going to have slightly more industry flavored solution in that space, what Infor or Apicor has for slightly more mid-sized companies. Uh, if you look at their pricing structure, guys, this is a very QuickBooks pricing structure that we saw in case of QuickBooks review, okay? You have monthly price. You don't have to worry about implementation consulting. Okay, this is going to be self serve I'm going to give you 20 videos and you, you are off to the races. You, if the product itself is that simple that you don't have to worry about hiring a consultant. Guys, now don't compare that product with a sophisticated product like, you know, Epicor, Infor, SAP, <laughs> Oracle, Netsuite, Acumatica, for that matter. <laughs> this is a very, very, very small product targeted for smaller companies, not even mid-size guys, not even mid-size, okay? Smaller companies, they are presenting themselves as the mid-market. They are not designed for mid-market. Their competitor is going to be Global Shop. Their competitor is going to be Pro Shop. Their competitor is going to be Fishbowl. Their competitor is going to be Mises. And that's going to be below $8 million, in my opinion, or probably lower than that. Uh, you know, um, but after that, you should be moving out to slightly richer product that can do better inventory planning, uh, better MRP planning. All right, guys. So now we can take any questions or comments. Uh, that's it for the session. Well, Andy, I, I'd be really interested in hearing the because what 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 the theme that I heard technically on this we kind of hit the business theme, but technically on this was a lot of breadth. But where's the depth? Do I have that right? Is that basically what you see when looking at this portfolio of products? That's exactly correct. Uh, you know, they'll claim to be able to be a fit for for pretty much everybody, but when when those naive first-time users, uh, first-time ERP co companies purchase these systems, it doesn't take them long before they find out they're fairly limited. I've replaced many of the uh, ECI products in the past, and usually it's because the companies are a little more complex, like multiple level bombs that want to do shop scheduling and things like that. And even though the brochure says these ECI products can do that, the, comp the actual companies had challenges couldn't get it to, couldn't get it to do it but it appears that they're kind of focused in you know for each one of these verticals focused in on maybe a specific pain point that they're starting to do some development and marketing around uh, to try to bring people to kind of to your point Andy right to try to bring in some of those new naive buyers that don't understand how to really articulate the questions as it relates to their business processes and because they are doing a really good job of taking one uh, maybe pain point uh, in a in a very specific vertical and not only marketing to it, but maybe developing some high level solution to that. It's very easy to um, uh, to to kind of get engaged with that and think that this is going to be a long term solution. 
So one of the things that I noticed was with the E2 manufacturing module or product, um, they they claimed that this product was targeted to the aerospace and defense parts builders, and that this would um, this has an add-on that will allow the customer to conform to ISO standards. Um, it's called the E2 Rapid Document System add-on. And it listed a number of document uh, generation uh, features. And I just think that it's important that customers understand that if they are considering um, ISO certification in their growth, um, that it's important not only to generate those documents, to have those processes in place, but in order to achieve certification and for an ISO audit, you not only have to produce um, documentation of your processes, the auditor is want, going to want to see evidence of your history of um, following those processes, that those processes have, have to, to prove it. You have to prove it. They have to have been adopted. And you um, you have to be practicing those processes and show the auditor evidence of your history of following those processes. So just just generating a, a document is is not going to really um, help you a great deal in achieving ISO certification or passing an audit. It's a very small percentage. It's a very small it, percentage. It's required. Yes, it is required. But it it's maybe, not, it's not it, going to get you there. It's not the yeah, big it's win. Not, <laughs> it's not where you fail the audit, right, Angela? You no, fail the audit is, when they try to test the system that's, that's and correct. they find that it wasn't doing what your, what your uh, processes said it was supposed to do. Right. So, so if you don't have like three years worth of evidence that you've been following the documented process, you're not going to get certified. So guys, obviously, you know, I know a lot of shops that are running, you know, on ECI or Global Shop and they are AS certified. So right. Phil, you are telling me that, you know, the auditors are actually going to look at your system and they are going to see whether you really have the evidence of this data. But obviously, we all know that uh, fundamentally these uh, products have those deficiencies that it's not going to have the traceability that a, a regulated company is going to require. In fact, the documentation is the least important part and you can probably have that, that 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 manual process even the bigger companies you don't require documentation to be automated you can do it in, in word what is more important is going to be your data and that data piece is missing but you are saying that these auditors are actually looking at the system but somehow they are approving it i don't get it well they and i've been through uh, many iso audits and and what that auditor is going to do is they're going to read what your process this is and they will look at your documentation and then they're going to go out into your business and they're going to see if you're actually doing it and they're going to do that by actually working with the people and say go do that and and are you following what you're supposed to be following exactly and to right. angela's point there's a lot of proof and it's and and that's just during the audit then they're going to want to look backwards into your process documentation and say, now prove to me that you've been doing that all year. And that's, I think, Angela's core point. This is not, it's not even promising that they're providing that. It's just implying that this is going to get you ISO certified or help you with giving you a very small piece of what that actually means. The key word is it'll help you. It'll, so, yeah, it, it may, it's the first and maybe 10 steps to get you there. Right. So there may, and this, there, let's go there, ahead, may be a, there may be a template on the process to document how you solder and, you know, but if you're, if you're, um, your, your team is not J standard certified. And if they are not actually following the J standard, um, you're you're not going to pass the audit, right? So I mean, that's an I think that's an example that we saw almost across a lot of what this company is putting out there of of where where there needs to be depth or where they at least need to show you that they understand that depth. They're just giving you enough to David's point. They're just giving you enough to say, hey, that's oh, I got to be ISO. Okay, these guys, you know, 
are going to at least help me. And they're implying they're going to take you well down the road and they're not showing any proof to the ISO standard conversation. They're not providing proof that they're actually going to provide you with what they're implying they're going to. They know how to spell and, ISO. Yeah, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it gets back to a lot of the points, you know, we've made this point several times throughout these, but it again, just to me, illustrates and highlights the importance of understanding what questions to ask and to not stop at that high yeah. level. Because when you stop at the high level, you get, um, you know, I don't want to say fooled by, but but it's very easy to be convinced by the, the marketing speak instead of digging deep and finding, you know, finding how much depth there really is. And kind of back to your point, Angela, perhaps some of this stuff exists behind the gate. We don't know. Um, so, you know, to be fair, uh, you know, there is a potential that, that there is some more depth behind there. But again, it is uh, very, very important for potential uh, purchasers uh, throughout the process to be asking these questions to, to find out. And Sam, I had a question for you because something you brought up on the, um, the SQL server side with only one of their products being built on that, uh, infrastructure, did, were you able to find if, is there a, a, a multitude of infrastructures that the rest of the, uh, solutions are built out on? Because again, I think that is, um, something that we've learned in, in kind of previous episodes, the importance of that being a, uh, you know, a clarifying point, or at least you understanding as an educated buyer, um, what you're really purchasing and, and what that infrastructure looks like, what a potential pathway forward looks like if it's a infrastructure that is, you know, potentially coming out of date. Yeah, so let me be very clear here that only for one product I could find that it was it had the SQL Server database as part of the database layer. I don't know how the other products are are built to be. Honest. Which product was that, Sam? Uh, this was Macola. You Macola. know, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Macola has been on SQL for twenty years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, but the other products, you know, and the way I look at these products, they are fairly in the desktop app category. Uh, so they're not they're not defining they're not they're not they're not they're not educating what it is they're using, but it's possible they're using SQL. Uh, so I don't know about the other products. I do know about Macola, but to yeah. your point, uh, you know, Dave, when I look at the infrastructure, these are completely different. Uh, you know, companies they have completely different strategy from the platform perspective. Their programming languages are going to be different. Their infrastructure is going to be different. So they are not deployed just on one system. They all are going to have very different strategy overall uh, from the infrastructure perspective. But again, these all products except Macola is probably is going to be slightly more sophisticated products like SysPro, to be honest. SysPro was the first ERP system that we had mentioned that, you know, that's a real ERP system when you go to a stage when you are eight to $10 million. On Macola, you can probably do 15 uh, you know, 20 or maybe more, uh, you know, because it's a beautiful single tenant product backed by a very good technology it's 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 very good product uh but at the same time the other products are, are not the same they are the very different. The details yeah uh and guys one final point that i want to mention here is uh you know when you buy an erp system you are going to be buying this for five ten years you are going to be investing significant amount of your own money because you have to build that industry functionality on top of an ERP system. And then you are not sure what is going to be the future of the product or the company in the next four years, because the investors who are going to be investing the money in that company is going to decide, you know, what is going to happen to your product. So I don't know how much risk you guys are going to be put, going to be putting into that. Obviously, ECI is a very sophisticated, you know, PE firm. Uh, you know, at least it is backed by a private equity firm. But given a choice, let's say if you were to choose between Pro Shop, Global Shop, or ECI, would you rather feel comfortable choosing something like, uh, you know, uh, Pro Shop or Global Shop, or would you rather go for ECI? Kind of a rock and a hard place. <laughs> well, and I think it, you know, the two there's two huge issues with this particular with this particular platform and this group of products, and one of them is is that the, the owners are from the retail space. That's what they know. You ask yourself, well, why pay a, a premium, a, a big number for this? Well, it would, it's an opinion, but it would make sense 
to access to sell software into the space they already know, which is their retail space. And then you look at from an IT standpoint as a customer buying this, how do you scale to your point, Sam, when you get to that fourth, fifth, six years, there's no evidence here that these are going to be be able to scale and there's no real evidence they provided us that they're going to be able to consolidate these into a good solution with depth in the areas they're talking about. So it really feels skinny. It really feels, I would say, uh, make sure if you're going to get to demo with these guys, you have some people in there on the, especially on the technology side that really can ask some questions because what, when, when they gate it like this and they want you to go to demo, I'm uncomfortable. By the time I get to demo, I want to have read a lot and I want my technology people to have read a lot and there's nothing here. There's just get the salesman in to, to sell and it's it's concerning. But yeah. don't forget, Phil, the companies that are buying these types of products are not the ones that you would be the CEO for. That's very, yeah. very good point. It's a but very guys, good point. one quick clarification there. So the uh, your only reason why I brought that point is because, you know, uh, we had uh, the pitch of the family uh, owned company in case of, let's say, global shop. Now, if you are actually going with the family owned company, to be honest, they are not going to be selling their products or the company that easily, to be honest, okay, in the next four or five years. But when you have these financially aggressive people who are looking for their exit in in next four years, it's it's a very, very, very uncertain position to be in, to be honest. So I would rather, you know, go for systems like ProShop or Global. I don't know, you know, what is their exit plan is. I mean, they could be equally risky, but this is a, a, a you know, surefire risk <laughs> because the way they are moving in the market, they are trying to exit in the next four years. And who is going to be buying this company in the next four years is going to decide what is going to happen to all of these products. Uh, all right, guys, so we can take some more short comments if you have anything, otherwise I'm actually gonna close. Amazing, guys. So uh, thank you so much for joining today. And if you joined for the first time, this was part of our industry series for which we meet every Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one vendor and we are going to have several stories that we cover related to ERP and digital transformation. So make sure you are not going to miss next week's show. On that note, thank you, everybody, for your time and insights. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sam. Y all have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Sam. Thank you.